I just, I just miss you so much. And, uh, oh, hi, you caught me mourning a loved one. Speaking of that, let's talk about Craven's Last Hunt. Hello! Welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. Today, I want to discuss my personal favorite Spider-Man story. And on the surface, it might not make sense why this is my favorite. It doesn't have a classic, uh, famous Spider-Man artist like John Romita or Todd McFarlane. It doesn't feature one of his arch enemies like Green Goblin or Dr. Octopus. And it doesn't really have much in the way of Spider-Man delivering quippy one-liners while trying to juggle his social life and financial responsibilities. Responsibilities. But what it is, is incredibly well written, incredibly well illustrated, it was deep, it was dark, and it was the first set of Spider-Man comics that I bought for myself as a teenager, and it's a huge part of what made me fall in love with superheroes. Today, I want to discuss the six-part Spider-Man storyline, Craven's Last Hunt. At its core, Craven's Last Hunt is a six-issue storyline in which Spider-Man's enemy, Craven the Hunter, defeats Spider-Man and then proves to himself that he could do a better job at being Spider-Man before deciding he has accomplished his goals and committing suicide. It's a dark story that has a long history behind it. Writer J.M. DeMattis discussed his gestation of the idea in a foreword in the trade paperback collection of the story. The main idea was always about a villain seemingly killing a superhero and what that does to them. His original idea was for Wonder Man's evil brother Grim Reaper to defeat him and bury him alive, but editor Tom DeFalco nixed the idea. DeMattis re-envisioned it as a Batman story where Joker kills Batman and it turns him sane. But this was also rejected because it covered some of the same ideas pitched for Alan Moore's upcoming Batman the Killing Joke. He rewrote it to feature the Batman villain Hugo Strange, but it was still rejected, although the Joker version was later used in 1994's Legends of the Dark Knight 65-68. Cut to 1987, where DeMattis pitched the idea to Spider-Man editor Jim Owsley, also known as Christopher Priest, who approved the idea. The editors on the Spider-Man books then changed, and Jim Salakrup came in with a goal to make the titles lighter. Uh, they'd been kind of dark, and even though Craven's Last Hunt was sort of against his goals of lightening up the titles, he agreed that it was a great story, it was worth telling, and he actually had the idea to, instead of telling it in just one title, like uh, the writer J.M. DeMattis originally intended, they would have it published across all three Spider-Man books that were being published at the time. That was Amazing Spider-Man, Spectacular Spider-Man, and Web of Spider-Man. Those were three monthly titles. Salakrup argued that this story involved Spider-Man supposedly dying. And if you did that in only one title, and the other two featured Spider-Man going on other adventures, well, it's not going to fool the reader. They're going to say, mm, well, he's definitely coming back. But if you have it go across all three titles over two months, well, then maybe you've got something. Salakrup especially appreciated that while it was a dark story, Spider-Man himself does not turn dark. It was 1987, and the comics industry was still reacting to the dark deconstructionist stories The Dark Knight Returns and Watchmen from the previous year. Grim and Gritty was in. But DeMattis had not just written a dark story, but one that gets to the core of who Spider-Man is, and that's portrayed as Peter Parker showing mercy for his enemies and a driving love for his wife Mary Jane, who he had married in the comics only a few months earlier. The first thing that appealed to me as a kid were those dramatic covers, and the Mike Zek artwork appealed to me then, and it appeals to me now. It looks fantastic. But the reason I keep thinking about this story is that it has deep themes of love and honor throughout. It makes you keep coming back and thinking about the story. And at its heart, it's really Craven's story, and he's treated as a complex individual. It really explores who he is and his perception of Spider-Man. It just holds up incredibly well. 
The decision to use Craven was inspired. While he was one of the original villains that Steve Ditko created early on for Spider-Man, and had proved formidable both alone and as part of the Sinister Six, he hadn't been used as a big threat in a long time. Dematis added a layer to Craven by having the character think about how he was of two worlds, both a hunter who craved to be among wildlife, and the heir to a noble Russian family driven out of their homeland during the Russian Revolution of 1917 that displaced the aristocracy. By the end of the story, we also realized that Craven had a family history of mental illness, and he was insane and depressed, which leads to his suicide. Powerful themes for a monthly superhero comic. Let's break down the core beats of the story to see where it works best. All six covers are fantastic, and were one of the first things Mike Zek did when he was hired on, before Dematis had finished writing the final script. The fourth chapter, showing Spider-Man emerging from his own grave, especially captured Zek's imagination. Zek said it, quote, was the absolute no-brainer of the six covers, and I completed that piece first. If an issue has a scene with the title hero rising from his own grave, it's like receiving the number one gift on your Christmas list. Anyone spending even one second mulling over a cover idea for that issue would have been in the wrong business. The other covers flowed from that one. He later parodied Chapter 5 for a Spider-Ham story featuring Raven the Hunter. The story begins from Craven's perspective, and we are privy to his inner monologue, where he ruminates on being both Craven the Hunter and Craven the Man. And while the herbs he ingests make him look young and give him power, he is actually quite old and is feeling the weight of that age. He reveals he came from an aristocratic Russian family, and that he feels like he is from a different era. He resolves to defeat his greatest prey, Spider-Man, and prove that he is superior to him. One modern Spider-Man story that I personally really liked was Dan Slott's run on Spider-Man, especially the Superior Spider-Man arc in which Spider-Man's enemy, Dr. Octopus, takes over his body and tries to prove that he could be a better version of Spider-Man. And over the course of that story, he actually becomes a better person just by trying to be Spider-Man. But the idea of a superior Spider-Man was absolutely accomplished over 30 years earlier here in 1987. And I think it's accomplished incredibly well because it's all about Craven's perception of who Spider-Man is contrasted with who Peter Parker under the mask actually is. Our first introduction to Spider-Man in this story shows him appearing at a low-level criminal's funeral at a bar and leaving some money so his friends can give him a proper burial, establishing Peter Parker's compassion right away. You might notice that Spider-Man is wearing his black suit in this story, and I think it looks fantastic when Mike Zek illustrates it. Mike Zek was actually the first artist to draw Spider-Man in that black suit back in 1984's Secret Wars. The idea was submitted by a fan and bought by, I believe, Jim Shooter, the editor-in-chief at the time, and then Mike Zek re-envisioned it, and he was the first artist to put it out there in printed form. Uh, at this point in Spider-Man continuity, Spider-Man has realized that that black suit was a symbiote and he separated it from himself, but Venom, his enemy, has not emerged yet. That wouldn't happen until issue 300, um, about like a year later. So at this point in time, Spider-Man has simply recreated that costume as a normal cloth version. It's not the symbiote. Craven ingests strange herbs and goes on a psychedelic trip ingesting spiders in this incredibly creepy and very memorable page and preparing to take down Spider-Man, who he instantly ambushes with a rifle from a distance, drugging Spider-Man. Dematis contrasts this and other scenes in the story with dual narrative structure, as well as a modification of English poet William Blake's 1794 poem, The Tiger, replacing Tiger with Spider. It's a perfect poem to summarize the themes of this story as well. The poem The Tiger is full of repeated visual imagery of eyes and fire, and repeatedly asks the titular tiger what made it the way it is. In the story, Craven is obsessed with discovering and mastering what makes Spider-Man so special. Craven tosses a powerful net over the drugged Spider-Man, ignores his desperate banter for a hand-to-hand -hand fight, and shoots him point-blank. 
The issue ends with Kraven and his henchmen placing Spider-Man in a coffin and burying him. And I'll tell you something, as a kid, I believed that Marvel had just killed off Spider-Man because Peter Parker does not show up for the next three chapters, really. It was amazing. Uh, keep in mind that at this point in time, resurrection in comics really wasn't much of a thing. Uh, Jean Grey had just come back as herself after being the Phoenix. So that was an example of resurrection. But we didn't have any of those stories like the death of Superman or Batman's back getting broken and then coming back to, to fight Bane. We didn't have big deaths like Cyclops or Colossus in X-Men that would eventually get resurrected. We just didn't have any of that. So when Spider-Man gets shot and buried and then doesn't show up for another few chapters, I believed it. Chapter 2 begins with Kraven wearing Spider-Man's suit and laughing victoriously, and Zek constantly inserts thematic imagery of rats and spiders. There is a secondary and tertiary story that follow the supervillain Vermin and Peter's new wife Mary Jane, respectively. One thing that's really impressive in this book is Mike Zek's artwork, and specifically when Kraven wears Spider-Man's suit, you can always tell that it's Kraven as compared to Peter Parker in that exact same suit, because Mike Zek illustrates Peter Parker as very life and athletic, and Kraven is hulking and, you know, just incredibly powerfully muscular. So even the outlines of the characters look different, even though the details are the same. It's actually quite impressive, especially when they fight later on. Uh, now, the addition of Vermin was an inspired choice. Uh, Vermin was actually a villain that Dematis and Zek had co-created together in a long run that they had on Captain America. And Vermin was a supervillain that Captain America and Spider-Man had to team up to take down. So Kraven decides if he can take down Vermin single-handedly, that will prove that he is the superior Spider-Man. So having that secondary villain act as the sort of antagonist for both Peter Parker, Spider-Man, and Kraven, it works incredibly well. While all of this is happening, Mary Jane realizes Peter is late to help her move into their new apartment and worries about him, but also realizes that she has no one to turn to to talk about this problem because of Peter's secret identity. It's a new responsibility for her. While Kraven prowls the city wearing Spider-Man's suit, or skin as he calls it, Vermin is tempted to go outside. Because the story is so dark, the small moments of levity, like Vermin being scared by a spider on a manhole cover, carry extra weight. And Dematis would go on to write the incredibly funny Justice League International, and that's a topic I'll have to cover on this channel sometime soon. He's really good at comedy. He just intentionally holds that back because it wasn't appropriate for this particular story. But he absolutely could have done that if he'd chosen. Craven continues to ingest his herbs and loses his handle on reality. As good as the art by Mike Zek is, it's aided by the clever lettering by Rick Parker. Parker uses varying fonts and layouts to help the reader understand not only which characters' inner monologues we're reading, but the mental stability of various characters, or lack thereof. Chapter 2 ends with Mary Jane approached by two men who seem dangerous, but when Spider-Man appears to save her, the brutality he exhibits instantly convinces Mary Jane that this is not Peter, and that something has gone very wrong. Each chapter in this story ends by raising the stakes. In Chapter 3, Craven begins killing criminals, believing this makes him a more efficient version of Spider-Man. Vermin gets the courage to go above ground and begin attacking people and Mary Jane realizes she has no one to confide in. All this time, we've had no indication Peter is coming back. Dematis and Zek work out some very clever narrative beats, like the parallel story structure of Craven stabbing at a rat in a cage while Vermin runs in paranoid circles in the sewers. Ultimately, Craven determines that if he can defeat Vermin in single-hand combat, he will have proven himself superior as Spider-Man, which he does in a prolonged, exciting exchange in the sewers of New York. Chapter 4 finally breaks the tension, giving us some measure of hope as we see Peter Parker go through a feverish dream of death and rebirth, and he rises from his grave. Peter finds a newspaper in Craven's mansion and realizes he has been drugged and buried alive 
for two entire weeks. But his first instinct isn't revenge, but to find Mary Jane and make sure she's okay. This is a key aspect of how Craven perceives Spider-Man to be nothing more than an efficient fighter who goes after criminals. But he misses the fact that underneath that mask is Peter Parker, who's full of love and mercy. Peter finds Mary Jane, he regains his focus and his strength, and he heads out to stop the supervillains because of his deep sense of responsibility. The next chapter begins with Craven's inner monologue revealing his mother was thought to be insane. He's confronted by Spider-Man, but refuses to fight back, telling him he's accomplished everything he intended to. He proved he could have killed Spider-Man, and he's been better at it by taking down Vermin. And he let Spider-Man live so that he could prove it. Craven reveals that he's trapped Vermin and releases him, and in the fight with Spider-Man, Vermin gets the upper hand. Before he can kill Spider-Man, Craven interrupts and tells him to go. Spider-Man chases after the immediate threat, and Craven kills himself. The suicide is an incredibly powerful moment in this story. Uh, I remember as a kid that I felt that I understood it. I understood that Craven wasn't in his right mind. He was sad and depressed. He didn't seem to have anybody to actually talk to about this issue and he kills himself. It's very final. Um, I remember reading later on that uh, writer J.M. DeMattis was hearing that some people felt that it sensationalized or glorified suicide, and he was like, well, that's not my intent. So he and Mike Zeck and inker Bob McCloud got together and told a 1992 story about, like, the ghost of Craven and Spider-Man, but it honestly, for me, that story gets too metaphysical. They were trying to mitigate the suicide in some way, and for me it doesn't work. I think that everything that you need to know is in The Last Hunt. I think it works. I don't think it glorifies suicide. You know, I mean, it's incredibly sad. Even though Craven is a villain, I feel it's incredibly sad. He's shown that he can be successful, and, and he just decides to kill himself and end it all. I don't know. It... it it didn't feel like a happy ending for me. The final chapter begins with Spider-Man crawling through tight sewer lines, a visual metaphor of his rebirth into a dirty, dangerous world. He ultimately confronts and defeats Vermin, but instead of administering a vicious beating, he hands him over to the authorities and promises that he will look for someone to help him. The story ends with Peter Parker returning to his new wife and Mary Jane declaring that he's home. Clearly, it has some heavy themes that I feel work very well. It's well-written. It's incredibly well-illustrated. I wish that Mike Zeck was still on a monthly book. I love his artwork. He's very, very talented. And beyond all that, it's very well-structured. Uh, every chapter ratchets up the tension, and the final chapter acts as a type of denouement. It's a very permanent end to Craven, but it was so well done that, ironically, readers and writers now really wanted to have that character back, but didn't want to reverse such a good story. So we ended up with derivative versions that were never as cool. He had no less than three children that each appeared trying to take up his mantle, a wife, an ex-lover, and even his cousin the Chameleon briefly thought he was Craven. Ultimately, Craven's widow and daughter do bring him back to life in some sort of bizarre ceremony, so these days in the comics, Craven is back up and running around again. And you know what? That's fine. It's not for me, but that's fine. For me, Craven's last hunt stands entirely on its own, and his death feels permanent to me, at least until some writer comes up with a fantastic idea for who Craven is and why he's running around. But until then, I think that this story entirely stands on its own. Does it have any problems? Not big ones, but it is a fairly dark story without a lot of levity. Mary Jane's story is pretty small and might have warranted some more space. That's about it. I think all of Mike Zeck's artwork looks incredible. He's aided by a great anchor, Bob McCloud. He's aided by a great colorist, a great letterer. The whole team is really solid. Now, this comic was written over 30 years ago, but I think it really holds up. Aside from the fact that characters maybe aren't using cell phones, and you might see a background detail like 
an older car or a TV that's a little clunky, it doesn't feel old. It feels like it could still be a story that takes place today. It's amazing how timeless it is because it's all about character interactions and feelings and stuff like that. Uh, is it the best Peter Parker Spider-Man story? Not necessarily, uh, because it's more about Craven and his perception of who Spider-Man is versus the reality. But I do think it's the best overall story told in the Spider-Man titles. Just my opinion. All right, with that said, let's see what we've got for fan art this week. We have what must be the first comic strip fan art. This comes to us from Roger, a.k.a. TARDIS Rider. So, did you hear the news? Chris Pierce is sending out gachapons. Really? The comic tropes guy? I love his channel. I know, his videos are always informative and entertaining. Don't forget his live streams. Inktober was great. Yep, they're always fun. He's super talented. Just one question, though. WTF is a gachapon! Beats me, man. Beats me. And I also got this piece by Philip Sasko, who interprets me wielding the Infinity Gauntlet. That's ridiculous. Where would I even find such a thing? Finally, Rob Ewing has this piece, which interprets me as some sort of a World War II soldier. It's drawn in a very 1950s EC Comics-esque way. Rob, this is amazing. I just wrote down Roger, Rob, and Philip's names on scraps of paper. I uh, don't need my Monkey D. Luffy pen. I'm going to put them all in the Gachapon prize bag here. Um, just reach around a couple times. And Rob, you have won the weekly Gachapon prize. If you would like to show fan art about this channel, just send it to this address, comictropes at gmail.com and I will put you in the running to draw a Gachapon prize. All right, so this is some sort of a digital game Gachapon, like it's an actual working digital game of some sort. So uh, that's fun. Rob, I'll get your address. I'll send this out to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all my patrons. We've gotten a very healthy boost on this channel throughout all of August. Also a lot of really kind comments and shares, retweets, things like that. Uh, in social media. I'm very grateful. I hope you enjoyed this look at one of my personal favorite Spider-Man stories and why I think it has literary merit. I think it's a little bit deeper than your average beat-em-up story. Um, not to say that those can't be fun, but this is just one that keeps coming back to me. I just keep thinking about it. And a lot of that is because of the imagery, thanks to Mike Zek, one of my all-time favorite artists, who probably I'll do a dedicated episode about him someday. But it's also thanks to the hard work of J.M. DeMattis to come up with dual narrative structures and just really contrast the idea of what is versus what is perceived. I love it. I absolutely love it. All right, please excuse my rambling. Thank you so much for watching, and until next week, keep reading comics.